Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. 4 11 through 5 6. In struggling with this, it's obvious to me that chapter 5. 1 through 12 really could go as a literary unit because it deals with some things about the second coming. And yet I think there is a break at verse 6 that seems to go with what's before, and so that's why I'm taking this division the way I am. There are two interesting uh, things to note here. Uh, verses 11 and 12 and verse 17 seem to be somehow unrelated to the rest of the context. They're almost like summary verses. And uh, James is coming down to a, a conclusion of a discussion that he began way back in chapter 1 about uh, don't talk too quickly, but listen, don't get angry too quickly. And then he picked up on that human speech in chapter 3 where he specifically talked to teachers about the use of the tongue, but expanded it to all of God's people. And now we're back into a context talking about the use of the tongue. It could be that we are still talking about church leaders and that there was some kind of rivalry, um, something like in 1 Corinthians. Or it could be we're just talking about um, life in general, and it's, it's real uncertain which it is. The rabbis have an interesting statement. They say They talk about the third tongue. And the third tongue, tongue, they say, is criticism. And they say the third tongue kills three people. The one who speaks, the one who listens, and the one who is spoken about. I think the rabbis have a thought there. In your Bible, at verse 11... Do any of you have a translation that says, stop criticizing? My Williams translation does translate that way, and it's very appropriate. It's one reason I think that this translation is such a wonderful English translation. This is a special construction in the Greek text that's a present imperative with a may article that means stop an act already in process. Now, that means we are talking about what they were doing to each other. Stop talking against one another, brothers. Now, the Tyndale translation translates this backbiting. And that's probably real true, for the Greek word used here is the word used in the Septuagint of Psalm 50, verse 20. It was interesting to me, in looking at the parallel passages... That criticism, or slander, is listed twice in a list of things that Christians should not continue to do. 2 Corinthians 12, 20 and 1 Peter 2, 1. I think sometimes we forget the seriousness of talking about one another negatively. I want you to know that the possibility is that we do it to make ourselves look better. It's the way that fallen man boasts boost his own ego. It's putting someone on trial without giving them a chance to defend themselves. This is a very serious thing in the church. Whosoever is in the habit of talking against his brother or criticizing his brother is criticized and condemning the law. Now, this idea, going back to Leviticus, particularly Leviticus 19, verses 16 through 18, which you probably know as, uh, you are to love your neighbor as yourself. We're talking, apparently, about covenant partners here, Christians criticizing Christians. And I wanted you to turn with me to a couple of passages that I might show you the seriousness, and I want to say that criticism is a spiritual cancer that will destroy a people. Did you hear what I said? 
Criticism is a spiritual cancer that will destroy a people. Will you turn first to Luke chapter 6, verse 36? Luke 6, 36. And I want to read through 38. Continue to be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Then stop criticizing others, and you will never be criticized. Stop condemning others, and you will never be condemned. Practice forgiving others, and you will be forgiven. Practice giving to others, and they will give to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, people will pour into your lap. For the measure you use with others, they will in turn use with you. Matthew chapter 7 is probably one of the classical passages in the Bible on Christians judging one another. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Stop criticizing others so that you may not be criticized yourselves. For exactly as you criticize others, you will be criticized. And in accordance with the measure that you give to others, it will be measured to you. Why do you keep watching the tiny speck in your brother's eye, but pay no attention to the girder in your own? How do you say to your brother, let me get that tiny speck out of your eye, while all the time there is a girder in your own? And on and on. And Romans 14, please, what I think is such a pointed reference to Christians' treatments of each other. I want to look at verses 3 and 4, 10 and 13. The man who eats anything must not look down on the man who does not do so. Nor must the man who does not do so condemn the man who does, for God has fully accepted him. Who are you to criticize another man's servant? It is his master's business whether he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord has the power to make him stand. Look down, if you would, at verse 10. Then why should you criticize your brother? Or why should you look down on your brother? Surely we shall all stand before God to be judged. And then verse 13. Then let us stop criticizing one another. Instead, do this. Determine uh, to, to stop putting stumbling blocks or hindrances in your brother's way. Look at verse 16. Stop abusing your rights. Now, I would say to you, that tells me, the fact that's mentioned so many times in the Scriptures, and the fact that it's put in a present imperative with a May article, tells me this is a characteristic of the people of God that we must come to grips with. I think that any reason that we start tearing people down when we're not part of the answer to the problem is probably out of the will of God. And if it's true that how we treat others is how God will treat us, we ought to take serious note of how we treat others. It continues then, and I think uh, very appropriately, by saying when we criticize our brother, we're really criticizing the law. Now, in Romans 14, it says we criticize our brother, we're criticizing the God who made him. Now, the word law here, I think, is this royal law, this law of the king, this law of love that we've seen earlier in the book of James. You might want to look back to chapter 1, verse 25, chapter 2, verse 8, and verse 12, where this royal law, this law of the new age, I would uh, really think it's something like uh, what the Sermon on the Mount must be, kind of a summary of that. So by criticizing our brother... We criticize the law, James continues. But if you're in the habit of criticizing the law, you are not a practicer, but a critic of the law. There is but one lawgiver and judge and one who has the power to save and to destroy. I think an emphasis might be here on the idea of monotheism again. Remember back in chapter 2, verse 19, it says, You believe in one God, you do well. The demons also believe and tremble. And there was an affirmation that just having correct theology doesn't mean you're right with God. Here we're coming back to that idea of one God. And that God is the originator of the law and the judge of all men. This little phrase, the one who has the power to save and destroy, is a very common, uh, particularly Old Testament way of referring to God. 
You might want to see Deuteronomy 32, 39. And one that I don't have in your notes is 1 Samuel 2, verse 6 and 7. And then two places in the New Testament, Matthew 10, verse 28. And Luke 12, verses 4 and 5. A very poignant way that the God will have all of us stand before him. That's why I think this, this little passage here is connected with the next passage that deals with Judgment Day or the Second Coming. I don't fully understand that, but I believe because of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, that all Christians will also stand before God. We will probably not be judged for our sin because Jesus Christ's blood cleanses from all sin. But it may be that we will give an account of angry, critical words spoken against our fellow Christians and that we did not act decisively and lovingly when we should have. Notice then it continues, the last little phrase when it says, Then who are you that you presume to judge your brother? And this is a very emphatic question in the text. I mean, it says, where do you come off talking about someone else? My friends, who do we think we are? We live in glass houses, all of us. How can we throw rocks at anybody? If we're going to start condemning and judging, who among us can stand? None. The next verse, verse 13. Come now, you who say. There's almost a shifting of gears here. We're, we're transcending to, a, I think, a different subject. Uh, we're, it's uncertain if we're talking about unbelieving Jews who planned this or believing Jews who still had this tendency of making very specific plans without God. And here, here is the, uh, the uh, saying. Today or tomorrow, we are going into such and such a city. And the Greek is so specific. It's like someone put their finger on the map and said, I'm going to this place and I'm going to do this and this place for this long. And this is what I'm going to do. And James speaks to him when he says, Today or tomorrow, we are going to such and such a city and stay a year and go into business and make money. Now, here is a perfect example of man planning out his life without God. Uh, young people, I hope that as you plan for your vocation, you realize that a vocation without God is a miserable experience as a marriage without God's will is a miserable experience. We try and try and try to plan our life, plan all we want to do, dream, and I want to tell you what, if we don't start with the will of God, we'll never be happy anywhere with anyone in anything. Here is somebody who had all their life laid out. But they left God out of the equation. Look at verse 14. Although you do not have the slightest knowledge of tomorrow. Now this seems to be a quote from Proverbs 27, 1. And you might want to look at that later. But to me it reminds me of the parable of the rich fool in Luke 12, verse 16. Here was this man who had apparently a lot of earthly possessions. And he said to himself, you know, I had such a good crop this year. I don't even have enough barns to put all my crop in. What am I going to do with all this abundance? Well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down my old barns and build new barns, and I'm going to put all these resources in there, and I'm going to sit back and say, Self, you've got everything you need. Just take your ease and enjoy life. Self, you've got it made. And God comes back and says, You fool, tonight, your life will be required of you. And who will use your wealth now? It's the tragedy of man making plans without God. And James depicts these Jewish merchants in that way. What is the nature of your life? It is really nothing. Now, my Williams translation says, but a mist which appears for a little while and then disappears. It was interesting to me the number of times and the number of different metaphors the Bible uses to talk about human life. I know we think we're so strong and virile and we're going to live forever and we're going to do what we want to. And one little microscopic virus ends it all. The Bible talks about our life as a shadow that flees away. 
The Bible talks about our life like a breath on a winter morn. You see it, and it's gone. The Bible talks about our, our life like a cloud, like a mist that the morning sun burns away. The Bible talks about our life as a wild flower that's here today and gone tomorrow. The foolishness of humankind planning on tomorrow when they don't have the promise of the next heartbeat. The next breath. The next sunrise. Now, folks, we are pretty frail creatures. We talk big, but we die easy. And the truth is, we're very frail. And any stability and any kind of hope for the future is not in our plans, but in our God. Instead, you ought to say, third class conditional sentence, potential action, if the Lord is willing. I was amazed as I looked in Paul how many times that Paul used this way. If the Lord's will. I think sometime in a flippant way we use this. Well, if the Lord's willing and the creeks don't rise, you better not worry about the creeks, fella. You better worry about the Lord. <laughs> and this is not something flippant we just say when we want God to bless our plans. Our lives are in His hand. And the Lord's will is the key to happiness and peace and stability. If the Lord... Wills. I hope you'll get your reference Bible. Look at, the, look at the, the notes in your margin of all the places in Paul and Hebrews where this is very specific about, if the Lord wills, I'll do this and that. Now, verse 16. But as it is, you boast, the word here is glory, of the proud pretensions. Your man's plans without God. What we're going to do and how we're going to do it. This word for proud pretensions is a wonderfully uh, colorful word in Greek. It was used of itinerant quack doctors who went around selling snake oil for it to, a remedy for every human problem and before you could take it and see if it worked they were gone out of town on to the next town with their traveling medicine show and that's what man is like when he makes plans about tomorrow without God all such boasting is wicked now verse 17 one of my favorite commentators is a is probably the best Greek scholar that Southern Baptists have ever had. It's A.T. Robertson. He thinks that verse 17 is the key verse in all the book of James. It's a summary verse that's kind of hard to relate to the context. We're not sure if it relates to all that goes before or exactly how it relates at all. It's obviously true. It's just hard to know how it fits. So when a man knows what is right but does not do it, he is guilty of sin. This reminds me a whole lot of uh, the great white throne judgment of Matthew 25, verse 31 and following, where one day before the throne of God, God separates the sheep and the goats. It does not say he looked into the Lamb's book of life and saw who was written there, but he says to them, I was hungry and you fed me and I was naked and you clothed me and I was in prison and you visited me and I was sick and you came unto me. And they said, Lord, when did you ever see you this way? And he says, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. And so here we have men judged by what they did not do. And their lifestyle showed who their father really was. When I read this, this is a very similar to me, this idea about when a man knows what is right. It's very close uh, to the end of Romans chapter 14 that says, if it does not issue in faith, it's sin. And this, of course, says, if we know to do right and don't, it's sin. It's, it's two very poignant definitions of sin in a way we don't normally think about it. Now, in chapter 5, I think there is, really should be probably no break here. We're again talking about wealthy people, these Jewish merchants. Uh, James has shown us the uh, real biblical tension that wealth brings. It is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's harder than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle because rich men tend to uh, trust in their own resources and their, their own plans and dreams. So he comes now to these, maybe it's the uh, Jewish merchants mentioned earlier. Uh, we're not real sure, but it says, Come now, you rich people. Now, I must admit to you, I'm not sure who he's talking about again. 
In chapter 1, verse 10, it talks about some wealthy people that seem to be Christian. No question, chapter 1, verse 10 uh, is, is believers. But when I come to chapter 2, verses 1 through about uh, 13, it seems that I'm talking about wealthy unbelievers. So I'm not sure if this is a warning to unbelievers that they're going to stand before God or if it's a warning to Christians to take seriously the responsibility of the wealth that God has given to them as good stewards. I'm not sure, but it, it, it's, uh, I think, significant either way. To these re rich people, he says, weep aloud and howl. Oh, my, this is the word shriek, wail. You don't expect rich people to go shrieking and wailing around. It's rude, but... Uh, what is the deal here? Well, this goes back, I think, to the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount, where we're to, uh, to kind of weep and mourn after righteousness. It's, this is a symbol of repentance. It's a way of saying, get your heart right. Quit trusting in wealth. Turn back to God. Realize you violated what he wants you to do. And then it says, over the miseries, a very strong Greek word, that are sure to overtake you. And this is not a future tense, it's a present tense. It's not that someday there's going to be problems, it's that wealth brings problems now. There is such a, a pull and a power in wealth and possessions. And if you don't have Christ to order your life, your possessions will control you. And so he says to these people, repent, turn this over to God. Don't let this misery of wealth overtake you even now. Look at verse 2. Now, there are three sources of wealth in the ancient world. They're all mentioned here in verse 2. Uh, your wealth has rotted. Now, if it, it rotted, seems to imply that it's foodstuffs. In the ancient world, they were, let me just go give you all three sources, then I'll come back and show you the verbs here. Stored food festival clothing, and weights of precious metal and jewels. Now, this is exactly the things that is mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount. Remember I told you that James seems to be an outline of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount? In, J in Matthew 6, 19, it talks about these worldly treasures. And it says that every one of them can be corrupted. It talks about food. It can be rotten. You can have a whole silo of grain, but if it mildews, it's worth nothing. And you can have beautiful, wealthy garments, but if a moth and a worm get in them, they're worthless. And even precious metals. Now, we know that precious metals don't rust, but they can tarnish. And it's a metaphor about the fact that they can waste away also. Matthew says someone can just steal them. Every one of these verbs here, the word rotten, the word moth-eaten, and the word rusted, are in a perfect tense. That means someone who says, look what I got. I got all this stored up. I'm going to be happy in life because I have this insurance policy, and I have this job, and I have this inheritance, and I have this bank account, and now I'm going to be happy. And I want to tell you, friend, if that's all you have to be happy in, there's no way it's ever going to make it. Everything man puts happiness in, the world can take away. Just like that. He comes to say, And their rust, look at the end of verse 3, Your gold and silver have rusted, and their rust will testify against you and devour your flesh like fire. Oh my, what does that mean? It seems, it's only what I think it means, it seems that the wealthy is going to be condemned because instead of using his wealth for God, he hoarded his wealth for himself. Knowing other believers needed it, knowing the kingdom of God needed it, they said, no, we're going to store it away, hoard it, pack it up, hide it, bury it. Someday I may need it. And someday... God's going to judge wealthy people by the non-use of their resources. Now, this word about burn their flesh like fire 
Some would say this goes back to the idea of putting chains on the hand of a prisoner so long that the rust ate into the flesh. But it may just be a metaphor for the idea that we're going to give an account to God for how we've used our resources. More and more for me is not a trusting attitude in God. Then he comes and even makes it even stronger. Where he says, you have stored up these things for the last days. I want to take just a minute and pursue this. The Jews believed in two ages. An evil age dominated by man's sin. And an age to come that, that God was going to break into history by the Messiah and set up a new age of righteousness. And so the Jews were only expecting one coming of the Messiah. And that coming was on the white charger of the military person to judge the world and set up God's kingdom. But what we know is, it's not that the Jews were wrong, but they didn't see the full picture. And what really happened is, those Jewish ages have been slightly overlapped. Because what the Jew never expected is, the Messiah to come once as the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 and then come again exactly as they expected him as the conquering King of kings and Lord of lords. Biblically, the last days or the latter days is the time from Bethlehem to the second coming. We have been in the last days for some 2,000 years. How long they last, I don't know. But we are in the last days now. Look at verse 4. There's three charges against these wealthy people made in verses 4 through 6. The first one is they kept back the daily wage from the laborer. This goes back to Leviticus 19.13 and Deuteronomy 24.14-15. These people worked every day to make just enough money to feed their family. But the wealthy landowners wanted to assure that their laborers came back the next day to harvest their crops, so they refused to pay them as the law said they must at the end of the day, and they withheld their money till the morning to assure laborers to reap their harvest. And this book is very, very precise when it says, listen to this, you, the wages you've kept back from the laborers who reaped your fields are shrieking aloud. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Now, the Lord of hosts, I used to sing Martin Luther's hymn, Danny, Lord Sabbath his name. I used to think they misspelled Sabbath or something, right? But Sabbath is the Lord, uh, the word for host. We think it can mean the, the uh, leader of the heavenly council, but I think uh, leader of the, uh, of the cosmic deities. But I think for us what it really means is that he's the captain of the army of heaven. What a strong term to say that the cries of exploited people go up to God and the God of all power acts on behalf of exploited people. Friends, if you want a word of wisdom, if you want to pick on somebody and you want to rip somebody off and you want to exploit somebody financially, you pick somebody wealthy. For the minute you pick on the widow, the alien, the orphan, the stranger, the outcast, or the needy, I want you to know that God is against you. Deuteronomy just goes over and over about how God is on the side of the socially outcast. The one that no one cares about is the one that God loves and is for. We ought to hear that again. The second sin is mentioned the next, next phrase. Here on earth, you have lived in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your heart for the day of slaughter. Now, this is an allusion going back to the book of Amos. Amos called the wealthy women the fat cows of Bashan. And he said, you have lived in all this splendor and sent your husbands out to get more and more that you can't even consume. And what you've done is just like we put a heifer out in a feedlot to fatten them up just before we kill them. That's what you've done to yourself by the way you've acted. That's a strong metaphor. Now, folks, if there's ever a group of people who need to talk about living 
in pampered luxury, it's the people of America. We have so much and we care so little about those who have nothing. I submit to you, it's a sin of wealthy, powerful people. Number three is in verse six. You have condemned and murdered the upright man. Now, it looks to me like that this is a metaphor, kind of like earlier in James, where it said you, you want stuff and you lust after it and you can't get it, so you commit murder. I would think this is the idea of murder as hating your brother. I'm not sure this is a exactly violent acts to gain things, but it could be. But it's probably this idea of hating your brother is really murder. And it says he offers no resistance. Now, I think many translations of verse 6, and I'm not sure yours is, but any of you have a translation where the last little phrase of verse 6 is a question instead of a statement? Any translation have a question mark at the end of verse 6 here tonight? Many scholars assume, as you know, there's no difference in Greek between a question mark and a period. There are no punctuations in the original text. And sometimes you can't tell the difference when you're reading it. It seems to say this. It's either an illusion going back. Remember how Jesus was quiet before the shearers? It may be an illusion back to that, that God's people are quiet even though they're being persecuted. But I really think what it means is this. He offers no resistance now, but do you not know that he will testify against you on that great day when the Lord judges all men's hearts? Yes, it may be possible to overrun the poor now, but there'll be a day when the poor who know God stand up. My friends, I know it's hard for us in a society like ours, in a church like this, which has the powerful, wealthy, influential people of Tyler in it to realize that in a city like this, the poor are being exploited and there is injustice and unfairness in our system. And until we, who the system serves, stand up, it'll never get changed. And if you don't think there's injustice in Tyler, Texas, you haven't looked around. Now, the real question is, what are the people of God going to do about it? Lord, James has been such an uncomfortable book. He's put his finger on our heart and on our motives, on our lifestyles. He's put his finger on our selfishness. God, he's just put his finger everywhere. And sometimes when we see ourselves in light of biblical truth, we're just not as pretty people as we thought we were. As long as we compare ourselves with success in Madison Avenue, it looks like we're the top of the heap. When we compare ourselves with love, sacrificial giving, open-handed, non-critical, non-judgmental love, God, we've got a ways to go. But Lord, thank you that that, that word of conviction is really a word of your love. That though we're pampered, you love us. And you want to speak to us. And you want to give us joy in the midst of so much that has not given us joy. Lord, thank you for not letting us go. Thank you for shaking us. Forcing us to look at ourselves and our world. Forcing us to face the ugliness of our motives and our priorities. Lord, now that we've seen it, and seen it clearly, help us to change. Oh God, help us to change.